Next, we have uh, Jerry Gibbs going to do a presentation for us on their pavement investment guide. And so Jerry works as a research operations engineer for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Thank you. First, uh, a couple quick updates. I, I got some information on our knowledge books from the uh, concrete in the bituminous office. The concrete office said theirs should be available in the early spring. I think there's some legal things going on and also converting the PowerPoint to articulate, which David mentioned. I have no idea what articulate is and I've seen it twice this week now. Uh, the bituminous office did not give me a uh, timeline, but I would guess it's probably gonna be early spring. Uh, update on our pavement investment guide when we were uh, planning our conference. I told the committee I could come down and tell you how it's working. I'm going to tell you how we hope it's working because we haven't received the software quite yet. Uh, Glenn Ingstrom is the director of our Office of Materials and Road Research. Uh, it's kind of been something he's been working on for a while. He put this PowerPoint together and he's a, a car guy. So we're going to get to see some uh, car photos in the pav pavement investment guide. And it's really a kind of a computer module for our pavement management system. I, w I was going to avoid using the acronym, acronym for the Pavement Investment Guide. Uh, I think we're going to have to work on that. Glenn's got a photo of himself here with uh, Floyd the Pig. It's a Minnesota Gopher uh, slide, but the real reason I put this on is uh, in the background here. This is an old coach. We got to go back a couple of years ago, but it says Jerry Soda there. So. If I'm ever going to put a gopher shirt on, it's going to say Jerry Soda. Module, it's a tool that's going to be put into the pavement management system. It has spending information in their philosophy and kind of a guide. Right now, the pavement management system, I think, can do a lot of the things this guide's going to do, but the guide's going to do it so much faster and better. Maybe our District 3 here in central Minnesota have an initial table of selected projects that are provided uh, to the districts. This program will have all the STIP pro projects programmed in there. Then the district materials engineers can select segments, uh, view from the table or the map, uh, look at pavement conditions. You can add projects uh, and then the outcomes will be updated right away. So if one project is, is in the program, they could say, you know, what if I change the scope of this one, I save some money, I get a different performance life, but I add two other pavement preservation projects over here, I've added life to these pavements now, and they can look at the outcome. One interesting thing within MnDOT is, uh, I, I've got a lot of data on different ride and uh, targets, but MnDOT uses a remaining service life of zero, which is at around 145 inches per mile, kind of a 2.3 2 uh, meters per kilometer. Uh, and really roads are poor around 170, 195. So within MnDOT, our different definitions of zero remaining service life and poor roads are different. Been like that, and I don't think it's gonna change, but we got a little kind of quirk there. So within MnDOT, here's our center line miles of pavement, uh, just under 30,000 lane miles. Glenn mentioned 700 miles per year. I think we'd have to, my math is a little different, but we're kind of, we would treat every road in about every 20 years. And our fixes aren't all 20 year fixes. So that, uh, that that's a program that's not going to work, which based on the miles we're doing now, that uh, hopefully this guide will get us a lot closer to uh, maintaining, holding steady, or hopefully improving our system. Every once in a while, yet people talk about how much they spend on pavement preservation. I, I think it's such a it's a difficult question to answer. MnDOT, it's probably 300 million annually, but there's a lot of major projects that aren't included in there. You know, how much we spend on pavements and how much we spend on pavement preservation are, are probably two different answers. I think, however, the uh, projects of pavement preservation, well, we're going to say about $300 million. Distributed by needs and formulas to the districts, there are targets. Some of those set up uh, 
with the MAP-21 uh, in many different fixes that are available. In the hot mix, uh, probably every fix that people are doing out there to a re reasonable amount of chip sealing and micro uh, or crack filling. We don't do many thick overlays. I, I think the cost of reclaims and other items there are maybe even a little less or, or similar so you can get a better fix. So uh, the, the thick overlay is not used very often. Uh, and, and then the bituminous aggregate base is kind of the new type of uh, new construction, reconstruction. And uh, we've been doing some white topping projects. Concrete side, we do a lot of uh, concrete pavement restoration, uh, a lot of patching work. Uh, we tend to replace almost every joint, which I think many places don't do. And, uh, diamond grinding after. Here's where it kind of gets interesting that the pavement office put together a, a mix of fixes. So this is the STIP, the four-year projects that are in the program. These wouldn't include the districts set aside some dollars for what they call preventive maintenance or bridge and road construction, a small pot, it might be, you know, two to eight million dollars that they're going to program kind of early spring. The, the chip seals, a lot of the microsurfacings don't get programmed into the step, the state transportation improvement plan, so they wouldn't be in this mix of fixes. So we are doing some things that aren't in here. But when they looked at them and they said, you know, we have two districts doing no short-term fixes, I, I think they would do some of those chip seals and micro type projects. In, in the long-term category from, you know, 6% to 57% of the program projects. And I think what the, our Office of Materials says, well, we're probably not sure which one of these are right, but it, it's likely there's some better mix of fixes in there that we could be doing. And, and I always say that, you know, all the districts are different. All their pavements are in different conditions. Uh, this is where we're at. So this is kind of the starting point here. The MnDOT philosophy here, we want to meet the Federal Highway Administration performance targets. And there is somewhat a limitation to what those targets tell us about the condition of the road. So this Payment Investment Guide will have some different measures I'll talk about later uh, that kind of the condition or health of the system. Uh, it's a better way to optimize our network level program. And an important part of this I think will be it, it will help quickly communicate the strategies behind these decisions and the impacts that when, when projects are fixed uh, or switch to different type of fixes, how the, that can positively improve uh, the system within a district. A variety of fixes is probably more sustainable and efficient use of our dollars. So with the Pavement Investment Guide, the ultimate goal is optimizing the approximately $300 million uh, on a network level. The districts the materials engineers within the districts will be able to quickly run uh, different scenarios and look at the outcomes. Long-term view, and Glenn likes to say we want to be uh, more intentional about the decisions we make. And he really says that uh, we want to optimize the use of the funds through a sustainable, deliberate mix of fixes here. Here's where it kind of starts to get fun for me. I kind of probably live in a different world, but that's the way it is. And, and what he talked about, and, and this is where, and, and kind of our starting point, Kurt, our, our pavement unit manager says, you know, this is where we're just starting to throw the darts and, and see what we hit. But for thin mill and overlays, probably uh, if you have a 2000 ADT, and I did a lot of conversion here, so there might be some uh, minor uh, snafus. I think most, I think we're pretty accurate, but uh, within the ranges. Uh, so 104 inches per mile, that's kind of just going from uh, you're, you're hitting the end of good and starting fair or whatever, and you're, you're in that right below good condition. Let's target a thin mill and overlay type scenario, or at least consider it there. In between 1,000 and 2,000 ADT, I think he's kind of uh, got you're right at the end of good, fair, and into really 
kind of a pour at 183 inches per mile. And he said, and I think the main thing I see when I look at this slide is if you're under 1,000 ADT, you're, you're probably just going to get a thin overlay. I know a lot of the, we worked with uh, Washington DOT for uh, over the years, and really under their low volume roads, the only thing they're doing is chip seals. And I'm somewhat a, a fan of their uh, program. They, they're, some of their pavements, they probably don't have the freeze thaw issues, which is a, a certainly a, a big concern uh, for us but the lower ADTs you're going to get uh, likely just a thin overlay. Uh, the other thing about it, so under a thousand ADT that's probably about 15 percent of the MnDOT system. In that thousand to two thousand we got another 29 percent there so the rest 56 percent of our system is above that two thousand ADT. So that's kind of how I, I put into perspective where these fixes are being applied. But I, I think the main thing from the thin mill and overlays is that the low volume roads, that will be the uh, current fix. I was uh, reviewing a project a few months ago on a low volume pavement that was uh, getting major reconstruction. So I think, trying to remember what the project started, close to 20 miles, uh, the first half I know was under 1,000 ADT, the second half was under 500 ADT, and we were doing major reconstruction. And I'm glad the district isn't here because they'd be throwing the darts back at me at this point, but I was thinking, boy, you know, a nice medium mill and overlay, which was the previous fix, would probably give them, you know, 12 to 16 years in, in good condition, and then you could take that huge savings and treat another 20 or 30 miles with you know, thin overlays and treatments. And I think that's what this uh, pavement investment guide will help uh, easily see the options you can do here. When we got into the, the medium mill and overlay, and once again, the, the, the numbers kind of bounce around, but CHIP program, the CHIP is the 10-year uh, uh, program that MnDOT looks at. So they were looking at, you know, roads in 2018, your IRI is in these range, medium, mill, and overlay. So once again, a, a starting point and, and the concrete sections uh, over 80, over 2,000 ADT, uh, and we got a less than 2,000 in there too. But uh, in, you know, if you're rougher that, than this point, 2018, then, you know, let's look at a medium overlay it would be on the concrete pavements. This is where uh, at the meeting all the materials engineers were, uh, I think a few of them stood up during this part of the discussion, that uh, there, uh, there was a, a big push for uh, unbonded overlays where your ADT is above 2,000. We're getting rougher than kind of MnDOT's zero remaining service life. Unbonded overlays have really been an outstanding fix for the department as far as long-term smoothness. They're also one of the most expensive fixes, lane miles or dollar, I, I kind of talk in dollars per lane miles per year to be in good condition. The unbonded overlay costs a lot of money. It's a great performer. I think only our kind of reconstruction for bituminous or concrete were more expensive than the unbonded overlay. So, but, and once again, it's the starting point. This is where the discussion started. These numbers would probably change a lot. The discussion starts to ha has to start somewhere, and here's where it, it, it did. And then on the lower ADT roads, uh, a type of reclaim in overlay on the, the rougher roads. The, this chart here, he, he showed, uh, you know, you got the ambod and the reclaims, the different percentage within these categories. Uh, he's also showing $370 million, so he's, we're going to have to come up with a good 20, 25% increase in fund to uh, deliver this type of program. And these pro projects are kind of plugged into the, the pavement management system. We always look at the future outcomes so that uh, here's our percent good currently. Uh, we separate them by interstate, the other NHS and non-NHS. So at the end of the step, uh, the CHIP, that 10-year program that includes, so that's the next six years beyond this, the STIP. And with the kind of some of the proposals and possible changes, 
uh, we can improve the conditions of our road network, which is the goal of the uh, pavement investment guide. Here's our, our percent poor. So when you look at that chip versus the proposed, uh, the percent of poor roads would also improve. So we'd have less poor roads uh, at the end of the 10 year program. The remaining service life, which I mentioned kind of in that 145 inches per mile type of number, uh, bounces around the interstate is actually decreasing. That's kind of what we're trying to avoid. The other NHS is holding uh, same, and our non-NHS would uh, improve. We want a longer remaining service life on our entire network. Part of using this guide, we want to give the, the district, uh, but likely the materials engineers, uh, a new tool to optimize their performance of their network. We're going to check the model versus kind of some of the historical data that we have. Uh, we've spent a, a lot of time, Bernard is awake high in our office, ha, has looked, uh, done some very detailed statistical analysis of pavement performance. So we're looking at the curves in the pavement management system versus what Bernard has kind of been checking. I think most of them are uh, very similar. There might be a few that are remaining service life as the decay curve is, uh, you know, off a year or two, but I think everything in there is fairly reasonable and accurate. I believe then the investment guide will, will help moving forward, keep those uh, pavement deterioration curves accurate and updated. The districts that talk about their objectives and strategies, uh, what their plan is, how they're gonna meet those outcomes, and then throughout MnDOT, just communicate the reasons behind pavement decisions. So part of, you know, why I'm maintaining, you know, why are we working on the good roads when this road is falling apart? Uh, I've always said uh, if I ever had a job as a district materials engineer, I'd tell them I'd want to fix all the good roads first, uh, you know, when the road is in that 100 or, you know, 90 to 110 inches per mile, let's get it in the pavement. and and probably improve the smoothness. It might depend on my ADTs and everything else, but you know, the high volume roads, I'm a big fan of the ultra thin bonded wearing course. It's just been uh, performing great. And on the lower volumes, I think the chip seal does a nice job of extending our pavement life. And we wanna communicate the fact that, uh, you know, we're working on these good roads to keep them good for a long time. I think this is kind of some of the interesting part is the health indicators that, uh, the disk that will be part of the pavement investment guide, the, the software program. And here's some of the things we, we look at. Uh, well, I think Federal Highways has been talking remaining service interval, which I think is an interesting kind of concept that, uh, you know, instead of remaining service life, which is, you know, hitting a certain targeted minute, the remaining service interval is the time between two fixes. You know, I did one fix and how long will it be to my next fix? Miles of zero remaining service life I've discussed. Uh, the asset sustainability ratio, I've got, a, I think, a slide coming up on that, uh, a few slides down, but uh, are you fixing more lane miles than you have? Our Clinton County engineer talked about that yesterday. He, he held up, he showed you the, the network health check. Uh, and you know, take a look at the fixes you've got programmed, how many years of life are you adding to the pavement, and how many uh, years are you losing. I think the, the cost per lane mile per easel, that's kind of another Washington State DOT concept that will kind of come in handy, and that the uh, fixes on the, on the lower volume, of course, then tend to be more costly. Uh, look at your mix of fixes. Vehicles, miles traveled on poor roads. We saw some data on that, I think, on the first day. You know, we might, even if you have a few more poor roads than you'd like, your vehicle miles traveled on those may be extremely small. And then the, the vehicle miles traveled on good roads. And all of this information should come out of your uh, pavement investment guide health indicators. How is the road performing for the users? We, I just mentioned that. Uh, uh, look at the physical condition of the road, and really back to maximizing the resources. Uh, 
across the state. Looking at the short and long-term goals and kind of our, our risk factors or working to eliminate any type of risk. But remaining service life that I mentioned when the, the ride quality, and so we convert IRI to a ride quality index. Uh, I, I did a lot of that conversion back to IRI, which most of us uh, kind of understand, but that's about 145 inches per mile or uh, 2.3 meters per kilometer. And at that point, we say you probably need you know a major type of uh, a rehabilitation. So if, as long as we can keep our pavements in better condition, we won't hit those bigger fixes. Another target that MnDOT's been looking at uh, over the years is the miles of pavement that we have that have zero remaining service life uh, today. But we've got a backlog of uh, 2,129 roadway miles right now. And what we'd really like to do is kind of move that back so that we have more of a, a uniform program. There was some discussion about, you know, the, the industry, if we get more money, you know, we've got to ramp up MnDOT's abilities to deliver those program and the contractors have to have the staff, uh, you know, in training to deliver projects. So when you get a big influx of money, we've tended to do, you know, a lot of thin overlays because they're easy to deliver and, and the contractors can do them. We'd like a nice uniform level of projects coming at us every year and maintain MnDOT's quality and the, and the quality of the contractors. Right now, I think we've got a remaining service life of 10.2. I think it's slowly been dropping over the last 10, 15 years. Here's that assets to sustainability ratio. Then, and I guess if we'd start at the ratio column, anything under 0.1 means we're losing ground. Right now, uh, we're kind of loo we're in that losing ground. Uh, I think this goes back to our uh, road the roadway miles. We've got like over 14,000. Why the miles lost are different each year is because we've fixed a certain number of miles, and those miles we fixed go to the mile years gained column versus pavements that weren't treated, those are in the miles lost, and then that ratio. So uh, those couple years of, well, uh, last year, this year's even 0.86 is not good. I'm not sure if we'll really end up at a 0.69 yet next year, but that uh, we're, we're way behind that target of one. Uh, and if you haven't looked at this, so when, you know, you have a, uh, a mile long project with a 10 year fix, you're adding those, you know, 10 mile years type of thing. So that's how that's set up. But uh, you want to be above one. Cost per lane mile per easel, I, I think will be a, a nice addition to uh, the way we evaluate fixes. You're taking the uh, equivalent uniform annual cost there, dividing by the easels over the life of that pavement. You're going to come up with a number. The Washington DOT, you, you can be down to about a nickel on the interstate pavements to 50 cents per easel, 10 times as much for low volume. I think on some of our MnDOT projects, be, and Washington DOT tends to you know just do chip seals on their low volume roads, and they're getting 50 cents per easel. If we're doing reconstruction, that number might add a zero or uh, something. So those low volume fixes, major fixes on the low volume road, we're gonna just at least see the number and you can start the discussion. I'm not sure how we'll change in the future, but this is the approach we're gonna start taking. Vehicle miles traveled on poor and good roads. Hopefully we've got a large percentage of our uh, drivers driving on good pavements uh, and I think in during well during construction time we, we've been fixing a lot of roads uh, throughout the metro area metro traffics tend to be uh, to backed up a little when you get stuck in traffic you won't notice how bad the roads are so maybe congestion's helping us out a little here to continue to, to look at more measures and different measures to uh, help guide our decisions. Well, software complete said September. I've been not sure if we got a software update yet. Uh, no software yet. Uh, and we were really hoping to have some reports out early fall that I could have shared with you, but uh, not quite yet. It'll be really interesting to uh, see where we end up.
I just got this in there. Uh, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I really think this is one of the, the the best pavement meeting I attend during the year, and I appreciate everything I learned from everybody. So this this is the one week I uh, get together with everyone, and hopefully we'll go far. So. Thank you very much, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Jerry, I'd just like some clarification on what MnDOT, how they define a thin mill and overlay. Do you have a certain thickness range that you try to fall in to? Inch and a half, or so, so how about under two, less than two, so. It works for me. All right. Thanks, Jerry. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.